Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. My dear respected listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Safiya Maryam and you are joining me today for the Secrets from the Seerah series, inshallah, that we're going to be covering throughout the month of Ramadan. I uh, hope, inshallah, everybody's fast is going well and that everybody's in the Ramadan spirit. You know, we're right at the beginning. Uh, yet and inshallah the enthusiasm and the passion and the iman boost that I'm sure everybody is feeling uh, hopefully we can maintain that all the way throughout and beyond the month of Ramadan inshallah ta'ala so today what I wanted to begin from so last session we had a kind of preamble an introduction to why the study of the seerah is so important and now is as good a time as ever in fact you know an excellent time for us to be reconnecting with the seerah in this uh, blessed month and i'm sure you all realize that you know in, in ramadan there's just a lot of baraka in in everything that we do basically so the higher your intentions you know set yourself goals and make them realistic but make them you know in a manner that you are really pushing yourself you know really try to um do as much as you can in this month and you'll see inshallah with the right intention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will will make it easy uh, what we don't want is for this month to to pass us by without having really really exerted ourselves and and so that we can show ourselves really exactly what we are capable of that in the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with you know the 24 hours that we've got we can inshallah we can uh, fit in our responsibilities of being you know mothers fathers husbands wives children students employees etc and at the same time um build a really strong relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and find time in the day where we can connect to the Quran connect to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the best way of doing that is by studying his seerah so that the everyday things that we do we can always link them back to his life sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and see what he would do in the situations that 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 we find ourselves in so starting inshallah right from the beginning um this is obviously just in the month of ramadan we've got about four sessions which is not a lot so we're not going to be covering the the seerah comprehensively but just a few select kind of stories uh, if you will that maybe we can think about and and see how we can apply them to our life so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know sayyid al mursalin the leader of all of the prophets the best of mankind we and the whole world were were blessed with his birth um most scholars historians they say that it was on a monday morning in the same year of the the the, the elephant event so in surah fil allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran talks about uh, the year of the elephant and and what happened so we know that it was at that time there is a difference regarding the exact date the month was Rabi'ul Awwal. Rabi'ul Awwal was the month and the date is disputed. And, you know, subhanAllah, maybe there is that there's a blessing in us not knowing. You know, these things weren't recorded by the Prophet Wasallam or the early Sahaba. Um, and they didn't have like a kind of calendar system the way that we, we do now. So there is some difference. Some say the 9th, some say the, the 12th, etc. Uh, but whenever it was, it was definitely a day... Um, that was destined to change the whole world. It was a day where, you know, the angels were, were looking forward to this particular event, to this particular day, because the coming of the Prophet wasallam was obviously decreed far, far, you know, before we were born, before the Prophet wasallam was born as well. His coming was something that was definitely going to happen. And... It's a kind of under understatement to say that it is and it was a day of celebration. You know, subhanAllah, the coming and the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it literally transformed the entire world. If you look today, you know, of uh, 1400 years 
later almost. How, alhamdulillah, there are Muslims in every corner of the globe. We ourselves, you know, we're gathered here, we're all listening uh, here today about the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are united in one thing. Uh, and that is our iman. We are united with our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are, are people who are followers of the uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are part of his ummah. So all of these events, all of our life and our thoughts and our understanding and our beliefs and everything that we are, because our main identity is that of Muslims is that of the followers of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That is our identity, first and foremost, before everything else, before anything else that we uh, kind of affiliate ourselves to. And none of this would have come into play. None of this would have been possible if it wasn't for this key key event that marked this amazing chain of events that transformed the whole world and took them literally like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran out of darkness and into light if it wasn't for the coming of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we would still be subhanallah almost living in the dark ages in terms of belief and in terms of faith and in terms of iman without him as our role model and as a teacher and as our our guide how would we know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted from us how would we know what is the best way to live our life so all of this you know it began in Rabi'ul uh, Rabi Awwal um, on a Monday morning and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, when he was born you know there's loads of narrations that we have regarding certain miracles that took place and certain significant precursors even across the world that accompanied his birth some of them are not they haven't been kind of verified um however what we do know is that definitely there was some sort of that, that there was a special kind of celebration on the earth and in the heavens to mark the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his mother, um, she said that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, there was a light that issued, you know, out, you know, uh, uh, all the way up to the, the, the area of Syria. So this just tells us that the for for the birth of a man like Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we know that this was not going to be an ordinary event it was something that was very very special and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was born he was born to a mother whose husband had just passed away you know very very recently Whilst the Prophet Sallallahu was in the womb of his mother while she was pregnant with him, his father passed away. And you can imagine how much of a toll that this must have taken upon his mother Amina. But she, you know, persevered and she was patient and the, she was blessed with a, a child that was literally destined to change the whole of the world. And after he was born, she sent somebody to inform the grandfather who, whose name was Abdul Muttalib. So the Prophet Sallallahu father's father was called Abdul Muttalib. So after the birth, he was notified about this, about this celebration, about this happy event. And very happily he came and he was the one who took this baby Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, carried him to the Kaaba at that time, carried him there, prayed to Allah and thanked Allah for this blessing because Little did they know what this little boy was, was destined to become. However, it was a time of celebration. Everybody was happy. A baby has been born. Um, Alhamdulillah. And he was actually the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who gave him the name Muhammad. So Abdul Muttalib called him Muhammad. And it was a name that was not common amongst the Arabs. I mean, even we see uh, throughout the Sira and, you know, history books, um, we don't find this name 
prescribed to anybody. So it was not a common name and it was through some sort of inspiration that the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, he, he decided to name him this. And other reports mention that even the mother, Amina, she also had dreams and um, inspiration regarding this name. So this name, Muhammad, literally which means the one who is praised and subhanallah what a perfect perfect name this is for the master of all creation who is at every single moment of every single day he is praised here on the earth and up in the heavens as well by the angels you know, not a minute goes by if you think about it not a minute literally goes by on this earth except that somebody somewhere on this earth is sending salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we are sending salutations upon him his name is being taken all over the globe in our prayer our prayer is not done until we send salutations upon him Allahumma salli ala Muhammad so this name, very, very powerful, Muhammad, the one who is praised and the one who is worthy of that praise, for this was a man who was the, the, the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one who was beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one who embodied all of those traits and characteristics that are pleasing to our Lord, which is why it's so important that we study his life it's so important that we study his character because we know that within him, the way that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived his life, the way that he dealt with people and uh, the situations around him, that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to act and behave as well. We have a role model that we can you know, apply to our own life as well. So after the, the Abdul Muttalib, after he named the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then on the seventh day, the circumcision was done, aqiqa, etc., which was the custom of the Arabs at that time. Now, in terms of suckling, the first woman who suckled the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after his mother was a woman called Thuwayba, and she was the slave girl of Abu Lahab. So this was something that, again, was customary, and it still is in uh, many places around the world, where a wet nurse is often uh, utilized in order to feed the baby as well. And it kind of j just em emphasizes the importance of us giving the best possible start to our babies, to our children. And we'll see that even after this happened, Another custom of the Arabs was to send their children away for a while to live with the Bedouin wet nurses so that they can grow up in um, kind of healthy surroundings where they can develop a strong body and eat well and acquire good, pure language, which was found in the desert Bedouin Arabs, which wasn't really found in the cities because you had like a cosmopolitan kind of vibe to the cities where languages were kind of mixed and slang was incorporated etc so it, the, the, the Arabs they recognized the importance of giving an early strong good start to the children and they did this in many ways one was through breastfeeding which alhamdulillah all the way um, till, till now we recognize that this is one of the best starts that we can give to our children around the world we recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human body in such a way that the miracle of pregnancy and the miracle of childbirth and then the miracle of being able to, to provide such a nutritionally perfect source of um, nutrition for our babies via the breast milk. This is, subhanAllah, the, the more you think about it, the more it tells us about the um the ultimate power and the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon his creation. So I know there's many women out there that maybe can't breastfeed for whatever reason. Um, however, we find that among the Arab custom at that time especially, it was that even if the mother couldn't do it, and there's many reasons why a woman couldn't, but a wetness was always found. You know, there was no such thing as formula milk or whatever back then. But even giving them 
other types of milk was not done because nothing really can compare to giving uh, breast milk to a baby so the mother of the prophet sallallahu she did suckle him and then he 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 was suckled by thuwaiba and then after that uh, by a woman called halima saadia and again going back to the point of how the custom was and this is what the prophet sallallahu also experienced that he spent time away from his mother and he was sent to live in the the desert so that he could develop uh, a strong healthy start unpolluted um, atmosphere and environment etc and we also you know subhanallah we should bear these kind of things in mind because we live in uh, a time and age where it's not easy to raise children at all you know back uh, back home or back in the day you can say it took a village to raise a child you know that's a very famous saying and it's true in those kind of settings it became easier for people to have children and to raise children because it was a collective community effort everybody was involved in the upbringing of a child and um, there was a lot of support available even for the mother etc and generally speaking in the kind of lifestyle that we have that's not always the case it can be a very very difficult and very very lonely time to uh, when you have children and just going through the whole pregnancy and then the childbirth and even after that you know subhanallah there's so many uh, women that don't have families to support them so many single mothers that have to do it by themselves it's definitely not easy not physically not mentally not emotionally which is why we should always kind of bear in mind that if we do know somebody that is going um through a pregnancy somebody that has is is going to have a child or somebody that has young children it is really really important to offer uh, support in whatever capacity we are able to do so um whether that is something simple like if you are a sibling and you have siblings that are younger than you you can be that source of support for your parents you can teach your siblings maybe something that the parents wouldn't be able to teach for example you go to school or you go to college therefore your language skills are quite good or maths or science whatever it may be but you are playing a part now in the upbringing of this child you are helping this child to unlock their potential you are contributing in giving this child the best possible start because that's what we want for all children whether it is our own blood whether it's our own biological child whether it's our own blood sister or brother or niece or nephew whether it's somebody who's been fostered or adopted into our families whether it's somebody who is uh, a neighbor to us whether it is just a muslim brother or sister that we know is their children it is our job collectively really as an ummah to ensure that our children have the best possible start because they are tomorrow's generation they are the future leaders um and if we don't invest in them if we don't really pay attention to to their early years and that includes everything it includes the, the food and the nutrition so we kind of mentioned breastfeeding before that if we can and we're ever able we try and um you know push breast uh, feeding for babies because there is nothing that compares to it so you're already starting off on a very strong foot then when it comes to the teaching when it comes to the communication when it comes to uh, the toys that we buy them and the interactions that they have with other family members when it comes to their connection with nature taking them out when it comes to language the kind of languages we expose them to uh, what kind of things we teach them and from what age you know all of these things that that come as part of the package of raising children it's not easy for one single person to do alone so in whatever capacity we can we should try and make sure that we are playing our part 
in investing in our future generation. And like I said, that might be, you know, as an elder sibling, you are doing what you can for your younger siblings. Um, as a parent, obviously, you're doing what you can, even as grandparents, as friends, as neighbours, uh, whatever we can do and whatever services we can offer, this is going to be a source of sadaqah jariyah for us, for sure. Because you can imagine the woman that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was entrusted to at a young age, her name was Halima bint Abi Dwaib from the Bani Sa'ad bin Bakr tribe. And she raised the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for pretty much, you know, the, the, the early years. Uh, in fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed with her until he was about four or five years of age and this tells us that you know all of those early milestones the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had those whilst he was under the care of halima saadia for example his first words he, the, the the first kind of communications that he had the smiling the talking the babbling all of that was under the care of Halima Saadia. So she had a very blessed um, role to play in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know from we know from experience and we know from you know science and psychology also back this up that our early experiences they really play a massive massive role in shaping who we are as people and how our personalities develop. So it's so important to give as much love as possible to our children. And obviously adults are just as much in need of love and care as well. I'm not saying that, you know, let's be nice to children and, and be horrible to adults. Uh, we should try and embody the personality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, regardless of uh, who we are and what age we are uh, dealing with. But especially when it comes to children, because they are so, um, you know, mashallah, they're so pure and they're so innocent and they are in need of love and care and affection so much because it teaches them so much about the world. If you raise your children in a way where they recognize boundaries but they recognize that love and compassion and kindness and mercy these are things to live by then you will be raising children that are happy and confident and will embody those characteristics and and treat other people like that as well so the reason i'm focusing so much on halima saadia is because you know, as a mother, especially, I think it always, it makes me wonder, and I think it's so beautiful and it's so amazing how a woman who wasn't the biological mother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, without a doubt, she played a massive role in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, you know, a child who is at the age of five or six, they have uh, well-formed memories. They can remember a lot of their experiences, etc. And we know the Prophet ﷺ remembered her and his experiences with her. 